triplanetary first in the lensman series by e e doc smith chapter eighteen the specimens escape knowing well that conversation with its fellows is one of the greatest needs of any intelligent being the nevians had permitted the terrestrial specimens to retain possession of their ultra beam communicators thus it was that costigan had been able to keep in touch with his sweetheart and with bradley he learned that each had been placed upon exhibition in a different nevian city that the three had been separated in response to an insistent popular demand for such a distribution of the peculiar but highly interesting creatures from a distant solar system they had not been harmed in fact each was visited daily by a specialist who made sure that his charge was being kept in the pink of condition as soon as he became aware of this condition of things costigan became morose he sat still drooped and pined away visibly he refused to eat and of the worried specialist he demanded liberty then failing in that as he knew he would fail he demanded something to do they pointed out to him reasonably enough that in such a civilization as theirs there was nothing he could do they assured him that they would do anything they could to alleviate his mental suffering but that since he was a museum piece he must see himself that he must be kept on display for a short time wouldn't he please behave himself and eat as a reasoning being should costigan sulked a little longer then wavered finally he agreed to compromise he would eat and exercise if they would fit up a laboratory in his apartment so that he could continue his studies he had begun upon his own native planet to this they agreed and thus it came about that one day the following conversation was held cleo bradley i've got something to tell you this time haven't said anything before for fear they might not work out but they did i went on a hunger strike and made them give me a complete laboratory as a chemist i'm a damn good electrician but luckily with the seawater they've got here it's a very simple thing to make hold on snapped bradley somebody may be listening in on us they aren't they can't without my knowing it and i'll cut out the second anybody tries to synchronize with my beam to resume making v2 is a very simple process and i've got everything around here that's hollow clear full of it how come they let you asked cleo oh they don't know what i'm doing they watched me for a few days and all i did was make up and bottle the weirdest messes imaginable then i finally managed to separate oxygen and nitrogen after trying hard all of one day and when they saw that i didn't know anything about either one of them or what to do with them after i had them they gave me up in disgust as a plain dumb ape and haven't paid any attention to me since so i've got me plenty of kilograms of liquid v2 all ready to touch off i'm getting out of here in about three minutes and a half and i'm coming over after you folks in a new iron-powered space speedster that they don't know i know anything about they've just given it its final tests and it's the slickest thing you ever saw but conway dearest you can't possibly rescue me cleo's voice broke why there are thousands of them all around here if you can get away go dear but don't i said i was coming after you and if i get away i'll be there a good whiff of this stuff will lay out a thousand of them just as easily as it will one here's the idea i've made a gas mask for myself since i'll be in it where it's thick but you two won't need any it's soluble enough in water so that three or four thicknesses of wet cloth over your noses will be enough i'll tell you when to wet down we're going to break away or go out trying there aren't enough amphibians between here and andromeda to keep us humans cooped up like menagerie animals forever but here comes my specialist with the keys to the city time for the overture to start see you later the nevian physician directed his key tube upon the transparent wall of the chamber and an opening appeared an opening which vanished as soon as he had stepped through it costigan kicked a valve open and from various innocent tubes there belched forth into the water of the central lagoon and into the air over it a flood of deadly vapor 
As the Nevian turned toward the prisoner, there was an almost inaudible hiss, and a tiny jet of the frightful outlawed stuff struck his open gills just below his huge conical head. He tensed momentarily, twitched convulsively just once, and fell motionless to the floor, and outside the streams of avidly soluble liquefied gas rushed out into the air and into water. It spread, dissolved, and diffused with the extreme mobility which is one of its characteristics, and as it diffused and was borne outward, the Nevians in their massed hundreds died, died not knowing what killed them, not knowing even that they died. Costigan, bitterly resentful of the inhuman treatment accorded the three, fiercely anxious for the success of his plan of escape, held his breath and, grimly alert, watched the amphibians die. When he could see no more motion anywhere, he donned his gas mask, strapped upon his back a large canister of the poison, his capacious pockets were already full of smaller containers, and two savagely exultant sentences escaped him. I am a poor ignorant specimen of ape that can be let play with apparatus, am I? he rasped, as he picked up the key tube of the specialist and opened the door of his prison. They'll learn now that it ain't safe to judge by the looks of a flea how far he can jump. He stepped out through the opening into the water, and, burdened as he was, made shift to swim to the nearest ramp. Up it he ran toward a main corridor, but ahead of him there was wafted a breeze of dread V-2, and where that breath went, went also unconsciousness, an unconsciousness which would deepen gradually into permanent oblivion, save for the prompt intervention of one who possessed not only the necessary antidote, but the equally important knowledge of exactly how to use it. Upon the floor of that corridor were strewn Nevians who had dropped in their tracks. Past or over their bodies Costigan strode, pausing only to direct a jet of lethal vapor into whatever branching corridor or open door caught his eye. He was going to the intake of the city's ventilation plant, and no unmasked creature dependent for life upon oxygen could bar his path. He reached the intake, tore the canister from his back, and released its full vast volume of horrid contents into the primary airstream of the entire city. And all throughout that doomed city Nevians dropped, quietly and without a struggle, unknowing. Busy executives dropped upon their cushioned, flat-topped desks. Hurrying travelers and messengers dropped upon the floors of the corridors or relaxed in the noxious waters of the ways. Lookouts and observers dropped before their flashing screens. Central operators of communications dropped under the winking lights of their panels. Observers and centrals in the outlying sections of the city wondered briefly at the unwanted universal motionlessness and stagnation. Then the racing taint in the water and in air reached them too, and they ceased wondering forever. Then, through those quiet halls, Costigan stalked to a certain storage room, where, with all due precaution, he donned his own suit of triplanetary armor. Making an ungainly bundle of the other Solarian equipment stored there, he dragged it along behind him as he clanked back toward his prison, until he neared the dock at which was moored the Nevian space speedster which he was determined to take. Here, he knew, was the first of many critical points. The crew of the vessel was aboard, and, with its independent air supply, unharmed. They had weapons, were undoubtedly alarmed, and were very probably highly suspicious. They, too, had ultra-beams and might see him, but his very closeness to them would tend to protect him from ultra-beam observation. Therefore he crouched tensely behind a buttress, staring through his spy-ray goggles, waiting for a moment when none of the Nevians would be near the entrance, but grimly resolved to act instantly should he feel any touch of a spying ultra-beam. "'Here's where the pinch comes,' he growled to himself. "'I know the combinations, but if they're suspicious enough and act quick enough, they can seal that door on me before I can get it open, and then rub me out like a blot. But, ah!' The moment had arrived before the touch of any revealing ray. 
He trained the key tube, the entrance opened, and through that opening in the instant of its appearance there shot a brittle bulb of glass whose breaking meant death. It crashed into fragments against a metallic wall, and Costigan, entering the vessel, consigned its erstwhile crew one by one to the already crowded waters of the lagoon. He then leaped to the controls and drove the captured speedster through the air, to plunge it down upon the surface of the lagoon beside the door of the isolated structure which had for so long been his prison. Carefully he transferred to the vessel the motley assortment of containers of V-2, and after a quick check-up to make sure that he had overlooked nothing, he shot his craft straight up into the air. Then only did he close his ultra-wave circuits and speak. Cleo, Bradley, I got away clean without a bit of trouble. Now I'm coming after you, Cleo. Oh, it's wonderful that you got away, Conway, the girl exclaimed. But hadn't you better get Captain Bradley first? Then, if anything should happen, he would be of some use, while I— I'll knock him into an outside loop if he does, the captain snorted, and Costigan went on. You won't need to. You come first, Cleo, of course. But you're too far away for me to see you with my spy, and I don't want to use the high-powered beam of this boat for fear of detection, so you'd better keep on talking so that I can trace you. That's one thing I am good at, Cleo laughed in sheer relief. If talking were music, I'd be a full brass band. And she kept up a flow of inconsequential chatter until Costigan told her that it was no longer necessary that he had established the line. Any excitement around there yet? he asked her then. Nothing unusual that I can see, she replied. Why? Should there be some? I hope not. But when I made my getaway I couldn't kill them all, of course, and I thought maybe they might connect things up with my jailbreak and tell the other cities to take steps about you two. But I guess they're pretty well disorganized back there yet since they can't know who hit them, or what with, or why. I must have got about everybody that wasn't sealed up somewhere, and it doesn't stand to reason that those who are left can check up very closely for a while yet, but they're nobody's fools. They'll certainly get conscious when I snatch you, maybe before. There, I see your city, I think. What are you going to do? Same as I did back there, if I can. Poison their primary air and all the water I can reach. Oh, Conway! Her voice rose to a scream. They must know. They're all getting out of the water and rushing inside the buildings as fast as they possibly can. I see they are, grimly. I'm right over you now, way up. Been locating their primary intake. They've got a dozen ships around it and have guards posted all along the corridors leading to it. And those guards are wearing masks. They're clever birds, all right, those amphibians. They know what they got back there and how they got it. That changes things, girl. If we use gas here, we won't stand a chance in the world of getting old Bradley. Stand by to jump when I open that door. Hurry, dear. They are coming out here after me. Sure they are. Costigan had already seen the two Nevians swimming out toward Cleo's cage, and had hurled his vessel downward in a screaming power dive. You're too valuable a specimen for them to let you be gassed, but if they can get there before I do, they're traveling fools. He miscalculated slightly, so that instead of coming to a halt at the surface of the liquid medium, the speedster struck with a crash that hurled solid masses of water for hundreds of yards. But no ordinary crash could harm that vessel structure. Her gravity controls were not overloaded, and she shot back to the surface, gallant ship and reckless pilot alike unharmed. Costigan trained his key tube upon the doorway of Cleo's cell, then tossed it aside. Different combination over here, he barked. Got to cut you out. Lie down in that far corner. His hands flashed over the panel, and as Cleo fell prone without hesitation or question, a heavy beam literally blasted away a large portion of the roof of the structure. The speedster shot into the air and dropped down until she rested upon the tops of opposite walls, walls still glowing semi-molten. The girl piled a stool upon the table and stood upon it, reached upward, and seized the mailed hands extending downward toward her. Costigan heaved her up into the vessel with a powerful jerk, slammed the door shut, 
leaped to the controls, and the speedster darted away. Your armor's in that bundle there. Better put it on and check your Lewistons and pistols. No telling what kind of jams we'll get into, he snapped without turning. Bradley, start talking. All right, I've got your line. Better get your wet rags ready and get organized, generally. Every second will count by the time we get there. We're coming so fast that our outer plating's white hot, but it may not be fast enough at that. It isn't fast enough, quite, Bradley announced calmly. They're coming out after me now. Don't fight them, and probably they won't paralyze you. Keep on talking so that I can find out where they take you. No good, Costigan. The voice of the old space hound did not reveal a sign of emotion as he made his dread announcement. They have it all figured out. They're not taking any chances at all. They're going to peril— His voice broke off in the middle of the word. With a bitter imprecation, Costigan flashed on the powerful ultra-beam projector of the speedster and focused the plate upon Bradley's prison, careless now of detection, since the Nevians were already warned. Upon that plate he watched the Nevians carry the helpless body of the captain into a small boat, and continued to watch as they bore it into one of the largest buildings of the city. Up a series of ramps they took the still form, placing it finally upon a soft couch in an enormous and heavily guarded central hall. Costigan turned to his companion, and even through the helmets she could see plainly the white agony of his expression. He moistened his lips and tried twice to speak, tried and failed, but he made no move either to cut off their power or to change the direction. Of course, she approved steadily, we are going through. I know that you want to run with me, but if you actually did it, I would never want to see you or hear of you again, and you would hate me forever. Hardly that. The anguish did not leave his eyes, and his voice was hoarse and strained, but his hands did not vary the course of the speedster by so much as a hair's breadth. You're the finest little fellow that ever waved a plume, and I would love you no matter what happened. I'd trade my immortal soul to the devil if it could get you out of this mess. But we're both in it up to our necks, and we can't back out now. If they kill him, we beat it. He and I both knew that it was on the chance of that happening that I took you first. But as long as all three of us are alive, it's all three or none. Of course, she said again as steadily, thrilled this time to the depths of her being by the sheer manhood of him who had thus simply voiced his code, a man of such fiber that neither love of life nor his infinitely greater love for her could make him lower its high standard. We are going through. Forget that I am a woman. We are three human beings, fighting a world full of monsters. I am simply one of us three. I will steer your ship, fire your projectors, or throw your bombs. What can I do best? Throw bombs, he directed briefly. He knew what must be done, were they to have even the slightest chance of winning clear. I'm going to blast a hole down into that auditorium, and when I do, you stand by that port and start dropping bottles of perfume. Throw a couple of big ones right down the shaft I make, and the rest of them most anywhere after I cut the wall open. They'll do good wherever they hit, land or water. But Captain Bradley, he'll be gassed, too. Her fine eyes were troubled. Can't be helped. I've got the antidote, and it'll work any time under an hour. There'll be lots of time. If we aren't gone in less than ten minutes, we'll be staying here. They're bringing in platoons of militia in full armor, and if we don't beat those boys to it, we're in for plenty of grief. All right, start throwing. The speedster had come to halt directly over the imposing edifice within which Bradley was incarcerated, and a mighty beam had flared downward, digging a fiery well through floor after floor of stubborn metal. The ceiling of the amphitheater was pierced. The beam expired. Down into that assembly hall there dropped two canisters of V-2 to crash and to fill its atmosphere with imperceptible death. Then the beam flashed on again, this time at maximum power, and with it Costigan burned away half of the entire building. Burned it away until room above room gaped open, shelf-like, to outer atmosphere. 
the great hall now resembling an oversized pigeonhole surrounded by smaller ones into that largest pigeonhole the speedster darted and cushioned desks and benches crashed down crushed flat under its enormous weight as they came to rest upon the floor every available guard had been thrown into that room regardless of customary occupation or of equipment most of them had been ordinary watchmen not even wearing masks and all such were already down many however were masked and a few were dressed in full armor but no portable armor could mount defenses of sufficient power to withstand the awful force of the speedster's weapons and one flashing swing of a projector swept the hall almost clear of life can't shoot very close to bradley with this big beam but i'll mop up the rest of them by hand stay here and cover me cleo costigan ordered and went to open the port i can't i won't cleo replied instantly i don't know the controls well enough i'd kill you or captain bradley sure but i can shoot and i'm going to and she leaped out close upon his heels thus flaming lewiston in one hand and barking automatic in the other the two mailed figures advanced toward bradley now doubly helpless paralyzed by his enemies and gassed by his friends for a time the nevians melted away before them but as they approached more nearly the couch upon which the captain was they encountered six figures encased in armor fully as capable as their own the beams of the lewistons rebounded from that armor in futile pyrotechnics the bullets of the automatics splattered and exploded impotently against it and behind that single line of armored guards were massed perhaps twenty unarmored but massed soldiers and scuttling up the ramps leading into the hall were coming the platoons of heavily armored figures which costigan had previously seen decision instantly made costigan ran back toward the speedster but he was not deserting his companions keep the good work up he instructed the girl as he ran i'll pick those jaspers off with a pencil and then stand off the bunch that's coming while you rub out the rest of that crew there and drag bradley back here back at the control panel he trained a narrow but intensely dense beam quasi solid lightning and one by one the six armored figures fell then knowing that cleo could handle the remaining opposition he devoted his attention to the reinforcements so rapidly approaching from the sides again and again the heavy beam lashed out now upon this side now upon that and in its flaming path nevians disappeared and not only nevians in the incredible energy of that beam's blast floor walls ramps and every material thing vanished in clouds of thick and brilliant vapor the room temporarily clear of foes he sprang again to cleo's assistance but her task was nearly done she had rubbed out all the opposition and tugging lustily at bradley's feet had already dragged him almost to the side of the speedster at a girl cleo cheered costigan as he picked up the burly captain and tossed him through the doorway highly useful girl of my dreams as well as ornamental in with you and we'll go places but getting the speedster out of the now completely ruined hull proved to be much more of a task than driving it in had been for scarcely had costigan closed his locks than a section of the building collapsed behind them cutting off their retreat nevian submarines and airships were beginning to arrive upon the scene and were beaming the building viciously in an attempt to entrap or to crush the foreigners in his ruins costigan managed finally to blast his way out but the nevians had had time to assemble in force and he was met by a concentrated storm of beams from every inimical weapon within range but not for nothing had conway costigan selected for his dash for liberty the craft which save only for the two immense interstellar cruisers was the most powerful vessel ever built upon red nevia and not for nothing had he studied minutely and to the last least detail every item of its controls and of its armament during wearily long days and nights of solitary imprisonment he had studied it under test in action and at rest studied it until he knew thoroughly its every possibility and what a ship it was the atomic-powered generators of his shielding screens handled with ease 
the terrific load of the Nevian's assault. His polycyclic screens were proof against any material projectile, and the machines supplying his offensive weapons with power were more than equal to their tasks. Driven now at full rating, those frightful beams lashed out against the Nevians blocking the way, and under their impacts her screens flared brilliantly through the spectrum and went down. And in the instant of their failure the enemy vessel was literally blown into nothingness. No unprotected metal, however resistant, could exist for a moment in the pathway of those iron-driven tornadoes of pure energy. Ship after ship of the Nevians plunged toward the speedster in desperately suicidal attempts to ram her down, but each met the same flaming fate before it could reach its target. Then from the grouped submarines far below there reached up red rods of force which seized the spaceship and began relentlessly to draw her down. What are they doing that for, Conway? They can't fight us. They don't want to fight us. They want to hold us. But I know what to do about that, too. And the powerful tractor rods snapped as a plane of pure force sniped through them. Upward now, with the highest permissible velocity, the speedster leaped, and past the few ships remaining above her she dodged, nothing now between her and the freedom of boundless space. You did it, Conway, you did it! Cleo exulted. Oh, Conway, you're just simply wonderful. I haven't done it yet, Costigan cautioned her. The worst is yet to come. Narado. He's why they wanted to hold us back, and why I was in such a hurry to get away. That boat of his is bad medicine, girl, and we want to put plenty of kilometers behind us before he gets started. But do you think he will chase us? Think so. I know so. The mere facts that we are rare specimens, and that he told us that we were going to stay there all the rest of our lives, would make him chase us clear to Lundmark's nebula. Besides that, we stepped on their toes pretty heavily before we left. We know altogether too much now to be let get back to tell us, and finally they'd all die of acute enlargement of the spleen if we got away with this prize ship of theirs. I hope to tell you they'll chase us. He fell silent, devoting his whole attention to his piloting, driving his craft onward at such velocity that its outer plating held steadily at the highest point of temperature compatible with safety. Soon they were out in open space, hurtling toward the sun under the drive of every possible watt of power, and Costigan took off his armor and turned toward the helpless body of the captain. He looked so 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 dead conway are you really sure that you can bring him to absolutely lots of time yet just three simple squirts in the right places will do the trick he took from a locked compartment of his armor a small steel box which housed a surgeon's hypodermic and three vials one two three he injected small but precisely measured amounts of the fluid into the three vital localities then placed the inert form upon a deeply cushioned couch. There, that'll take care of the gas in five or six hours. The paralysis will wear off long before that, so he'll be all right when he wakes up, and we're going away from here with everything we can put out. I've done everything I know how to do for the present. Then only did Costigan turn and look down directly into Cleo's eyes, wide, eloquent blue eyes that gazed back up into his, tender and unafraid, eyes freighted with the oldest message of woman to chosen man. His hard young face softened wonderfully as he stared at her. There were two quick steps, and they were in each other's arms. Lips upon eager lips, blue eyes to gray, motionless they stood clasped in ecstasy, thinking nothing of the dreadful past, nothing of the fearful future, conscious only of the glorious, wonderful present. Cleo mine, darling, girl, girl, how I love you. Costigan's deep voice was husky with emotion. I haven't kissed you for seven thousand years. I don't rate you by a million steps, but if I can just get you out of this mess, I swear by all the gods of interplanetary space. You needn't love her. Rate me? Good heavens, Conway, it's just the other way. Stop it, he commanded in her ear. I'm still dizzy at the idea of you loving me at all. 
to say nothing of loving me this way. But you do, and that's all I ask, here or hereafter. Love you? <laughs> Love you? Their mutual embrace tightened, and her low voice thrilled brokenly as she went on. Conway, dearest, I can't say a thing, but you know. Oh, Conway. After a time, Cleo drew a long and tremulous but supremely happy breath as the realities of their predicament once more obtruded themselves upon her consciousness. She released herself gently from Costigan's arms. Do you really think that there is a chance of us getting back to Earth, so that we could be together always? A chance, yes. A probability, no, he replied unequivocally. It depends upon two things. First, how much of a start we got on Narado. His ship is the biggest and fastest thing I ever saw, and if he strips her down and drives her, which he will, he'll catch us long before we can make Tellus. On the other hand, I gave Rodebush a lot of data, and if he and Lyman Cleveland can add it to their own stuff and get that super ship of ours rebuilt in time, they'll be out here on the prowl, and they'll have what it takes to give even Narado plenty of argument. No use worrying about it, anyway. We won't know anything until we can detect one or the other of them, and then will be the time to do something about it. If Narado catches us, will you— She paused. Rub you out? I will not. Even if he does catch us and take us back to Nevia, I won't. There's lots more time coming onto the clock. Narado won't hurt either of us badly enough to leave scars, either physical, mental, or moral. I'd kill you in a second if it were Roger. He's dirty. He's mean. He's thoroughly bad. But Narado's a good enough old scout in his way. He's big and he's clean. You know, I could really like that fish if I could meet him on terms of equality sometime. I couldn't, she declared vigorously. He's crawly and scaly and snaky, and he smells so, so, so rank and fishy. Costigan laughed deeply. <laughs> details, girl, mere details. I've seen people who looked like money in the bank, and who smelled like a bouquet of violets that you couldn't trust half the length of Narado's neck. But look what he did to us, she protested. And they weren't trying to recapture us back there, they were trying to kill us. That was perfectly all right, what he did and what they did. What else could they have done, he wanted to know. And while you're looking, Look at what we did to them. Plenty, I'd say. But we all had to do it, and neither side will blame the other for doing it. He's a square shooter, I tell you. Well, maybe, but I don't like him a bit. And let's not talk about him any more. Let's talk about us. Remember what you said once, when you advised me to let you lay or whatever it was? Womanlike, she wished to dip again lightly into the waters of pure emotion, even though she had such a short time before led the man out of their profoundest depths. But Costigan, into whose hard life love of woman had never before entered, had not yet recovered sufficiently from his soul-shaking plunge to follow her lead. Inarticulate, distrusting his newly found supreme happiness, he must need stay out of those enchanted waters or plunge again. And he was afraid to plunge, diffident still deeming himself unworthy of the miracle of this wonder-girl's love, even though every fiber of his being shrieked its demand to feel again that slender body in his arms. He did not consciously think those thoughts. He acted them without thinking. They were prime basics in that which made Conway Costigan what he was. I do remember, and I still think it's a sound idea even though I am too far gone now to let you put it into effect, he assured her, half seriously. He kissed her, tenderly and reverently, then studied her carefully. But you look as though you'd been on a Martian picnic. When did you last eat? I don't remember exactly. Uh, this morning, I think. Or maybe last night or yesterday morning? I thought so. Bradley and I can eat anything that's chewable and drink anything that will pour, but you can't. I'll scout around and see if I can't fix up something that you'll be able to eat. He rummaged through the storerooms, emerging with sundry viands from which he prepared a highly satisfactory meal. Think you can sleep now, sweetheart? After supper, once more within the circle of Costigan's arms, 
Cleo nodded her head against his shoulder. Of course I can, dear. Now that you are with me, out here alone, I'm not a bit afraid any more. You will get us back to Earth some way, sometime. I just know that you will. Good night, Conway. Good night, Cleo, little sweetheart, he whispered, and went back to Bradley's side. In due time the captain recovered consciousness and slept. Then for days the speedster flashed on toward our distant solar system, days during which her wide-flung detector screens remained cold. I don't know whether I'm afraid they'll hit something or afraid they won't, Costigan remarked more than once, but finally those tenuous sentinels did in fact encounter an interfering vibration. Along the detector line a visibeam sped, and Costigan's face hardened as he saw the unmistakable outline of Nerado's interstellar cruiser far behind them. Well, a stern chase always was a long one, Costigan said finally. He can't catch us for plenty of days yet. Now what? For the alarms of the detectors had broken out anew. There was still another point of interference to be investigated. Costigan traced it, and there, almost dead ahead of them, between them and their son, nearing them at the incomprehensible rate of the sum of the two vessels' velocities, came another cruiser of the Nevians. Must be the sister ship coming back from our system with a load of iron, Costigan deduced. Heavily loaded as she is, we may be able to dodge her, and she is coming so fast that if we stay out of her range we'll be all right. He won't be able to stop for probably three or four days. But if our super ship is anywhere in these parts, now's the time for her to rally round. He gave the speedster all the side thrust she would take. Then, putting every available communicator tube behind a tight beam, he aimed it at Saul and began sending out a long continued call to his fellows of the Triplanetary Service. Nearer and nearer the Nevian flashed, trying with all her power to intercept the speedster, and it soon became evident that, heavily laden though she was, she could make enough sideways to bring her within range at the time of meeting. Of course they've got partial neutralization of inertia, the same as we have, Costigan cogitated, and by the way he's coming, I'd say that he had orders to blow us out of the ether. He knows as well as we do that he can't capture us alive at anything like the relative velocities we've got now. I can't give her any more side thrusts without overloading the gravity controls. So overloaded they've got to be. Strap down, you two, because they may go out entirely. Do you think that you can pull away from them, Conway? Cleo was staring in horrified fascination into the plate, watching the pictured vessel increase in size moment by moment. I don't know whether I can or not, but I'm going to try. Just in case we don't, though, I'm going to keep on yelling for help. In solid? All right, boat. Do your stuff. End of chapter 18